Good afternoon to everybody. So my name is François Bremont. So I'm the research director of the STARS. Yeah. Yes, sorry, désolé, il y a vraiment un bruit de fond uh, horrible. It depends on uh, Nicolas Girard. And his PhD uh, title is Learning and Geometric Approaches for Automatic Extraction of Objects from uh, Remote Sensing Images. So we have a three composed <laughs> of the two reviewers. So Lawrence, which is professor of the University of Trento, uh, Nicolas Corti, which is a professor of Irida. And uh, uh, so we have the examiner of me, so Liam Sharpia, which is also from Iria, Justin Solomon, professor at MIT, and uh, we have the uh, supervisor, Rosia Tarapata, from Iria. So I think that's the name of the lead. So we have 45 minutes to present the presentation. Okay. The quality of audio is really bad. So do you need the duration? Okay. So uh, we start. Hello, uh, my name is Bruno. The PhD students, uh, the Titan team of Maria, and thank you for attending my PhD uh, presentation on uh, learning and geometric approaches for automatic extraction of objects from remote sensing images, uh, which was funded by uh, AMR. So our objective is to automatically create or update the map of the world from remote sensing images, which have the ability to quickly cover very large areas at a high resolution. Sorry, some technical difficulties. OK. OK, speak now. OK. Uh, so remote sensing images have the ability to quickly cover uh, very large areas of a high resolution. For example, the whole surface area of India every single day. Uh, it has applications in navigation, urban planning, autonomous driving, uh, etc. Uh, an obvious solution would be to use uh, existing maps as ground truth for training the machine learning uh, algorithm. Um, but for this, we face uh, two different challenges, which we uh, will find the two parts of my presentation. The first challenge is the map alignment, and the second challenge is that maps are in vector format. So the first challenge is uh, map alignment. So here I show two examples. On the left, I have downloaded uh, annotations from OpenStreetMap, and we can see that the red uh, building polygons do not fit the buildings on the image. And on the right is a snapshot of Google Maps, where you can see that the blue road is not overlay on top of the road on the image. So we have some smooth misalignment between image and map. And here up to eight meters or 27 pixels. It is not uh, constant across the image with uh, even possible building locations in the uh, same. So, could you uh, switch to this uh, microphone? Oh, uh, talk to that. Switch to the other microphone. Like this. So, I switched to the microphone. Maybe the jury uh, who attend remotely can. Do you hear me better? Yes. Yes, it's better. I can continue. This is this is much much better. Okay, cool. Thanks. <laughs> um, so, what are the main causes of misalignments? Well, first we have uh, we can have errors in the maps themselves. For example, because of human imprecision during annotation, or uh, imprecise source material. But the biggest source of misalignment is due to the author rectification uh, process which aims to project an image captured with a perspective view into an image captured with a orthographic view. And so it also projects the image into the same uh, reference system as the maps, so that images and maps can be overlaid on top of each other. 
Uh, this process requires a digital terrain model, which is essentially a 3D uh, model of the surface of the Earth so that we can perform this projection on top of that surface. And this model has certain uh, limited resolution, for example, 10 meters per pixel or 100 meters per <coughs> pixel. And it has also some elevation error, uh, for example, a mean uh, error of one meter. So I show here an example of uh, orthorectified image, which is of Inria Sofia Antipolis here. And I have also several other such uh, images of the same area, but which were captured with different satellites or different sensors uh, from different angles. And possibly they were also rectified with a different terrain model. So we can see that cycling through all of them, uh, there's some misalignment between any two of those images. So we can imagine if there are some annotations that were made on one image, they would misalign uh, to the uh, other images. So our first project is a noisy supervision for learning map alignment, where we want to learn to correct alignment of existing maps while only having access to noisy or misaligned data. Some uh, related works. First, there is the uh, monomodal uh, setting where we want to align or register an image, a photo over another photo that look very similar. Uh, for this, we can use key point matching. And there are also deep learning methods such as Flownet uh, uses uh, CNN to predict optical flow, or Quicksilver learns an image similarity uh, measure. Uh, however, in our case, we want to align uh, geometry in the form of polygon over a photo. So we are in a multimodal setting. And for this, we can use the structural similarity measure that essentially is key point matching, but looks for key points which are similar uh, in the polygon map and the photo. And our own work is uh, inspired by the double input unit like model to predict large displacements in a multi-resolution approach. Uh, some motivation for uh, noisy uh, supervision. Uh, for the context, if we have enough good ground truth data, then we can just apply fully supervised uh, machine learning methods and it should work. However, in our case, in remote sensing, we have few data that are perfectly uh, manually correlated. And so our objective is to get perfect annotations. And the solution being to learn from the available annotations, even if they are noisy, in our case, misaligned. And for this, we will use a multiple rounds training scheme to correct the ground truth annotations at each round in order to better train the model at the next round. So here is the neural network we use for uh, alignments. It has two inputs and two outputs. The first input is the satellite image. Uh, and the second input is the rasterized image of the misaligned polygons. And on the right, we have uh, two outputs. The first one is the displacement map. So for each pixel of the input uh, image, we output a 2D displacement vector. And we also add a segmentation output. So this segmentation segments the aligned uh, buildings. We use this to leverage multitask learning, so to help the neural network train better, but also to increase uh, final performance. Uh, this neural network is then used in a multi-resolution pipeline. So uh, at the bottom here, I show how one of this network is used in uh, for a, a certain step at a certain resolution. So we have the image input in blue, the misaligned polygons here, and a certain downscaling factor. We apply uh, this downscaling factor to both. Then we rasterize the polygons, uh, which is input to the network. It gives us a displacement map, which we apply to the input uh, polygons. And then we get aligned polygons at that scale. And here we can apply, for example, four different networks at four different scales, from coarse to fine scale, in order to recover the full uh, alignment. Uh, finally, we need a ground truth displacement map uh, in order to learn the displacement map output. And right now, we only have access to uh, ground truth annotations in red, which we assume they are aligned. Uh, for this, we generate displacement maps uh, using 2D Gaussian fields which we apply to the input red polygons in order to obtain misaligned uh, blue polygons. And then we will ask the neural network to output the inverse displacement map 
uh, that when applied on the blue polygons, will align them on the uh, red ones. And now I will show you a little video explaining the multiple rounds training process. So we have initial annotations in red. We generate uh, misaligned uh, annotations in blue. And for the first round of training, we will train the model uh, to align the blue on the red. So it does this for uh, some time. Once the model is converged, round one is finished. And we now use the blue polygons as ground truth for the round two. Uh, for the round, second round, we train the green polygons to align on the blue ones. And when, once it's finished, the green ones now become the new ground truth. Uh, and then we train for our third round with the polygons in magenta. And so little by little, the polygon become more and more well aligned. And we obtain the final polygon here in magenta. Uh, here is a summary image of uh, this result. So in red, we have the initial uh, annotations that we train from. After the first round of training, we obtain the blue polygons. So on the top here, we can see that they are a bit more well aligned than before. However, on the bottom right, we can see that the blue polygons are a bit worse than the red ones. However, this is only a small uh, crop of one of the images of the whole data sets. And the idea is that the, over the whole data set, the blue polygons are generally uh, more well aligned. And so when we train for a second round of training, we obtain the green uh, polygons, which here, see, we uh, they all fit the uh, buildings in the image. Uh, in order to quantify the error of alignment that we make, I had to manually align uh, test polygons uh, from one image. Uh, and so we can uh, measure for each uh, manually aligned vertex uh, its distance with the predicted aligned vertex of the, the output uh, of the model. And so in the red curve here corresponds to the original annotation. Uh, the uh, bottom ver um, axis shows this error in pixels, and the vertical axis is the fraction of vertices uh, of the uh, aligned uh, polygons. So we can see that half of vertices here have an error uh, less than uh, 18 pixels. The other half have an error larger than this. So this is the original annotations that we use for training. After the first round of training, we get the blue curve, where here half of vertices have an error less than 12 pixels. And then after the second round of training, it drops down to uh, three pixels. And we can see the third round of training in gray, which uh, we see doesn't add any more uh, alignments at this point. So uh, how come this uh, multiple rounds training scheme works? Uh, so our first hypothesis was that there is enough good ground truth in the data set that drive the training. And uh, while the noisy uh, ground truth does not perturb the training too much, such that round after round, the proportion of uh, well-aligned annotation increases. Uh, however, uh, we cannot quantify the error in the original data set because we don't have access to the perfect underlying ground truth. So in order to test this hypothesis, we perform what we call the noisier original annotations uh, experiments, where we add even more noise to all the polygons of the data sets. So we added a noise of 16 pixels of amplitude. And uh, we ob thus obtain the red dash curve of the original noisier annotations. So we can see they are even worse than before. Uh, we apply our whole uh, multiple ones uh, training scheme uh, on those noisier annotations. And we thus uh, obtain uh, annotations in round one in blue, and then the curve uh, for round two is green, and then the third round in gray. So the dash gray is the noisier version. The solid gray is the uh, normal uh, noisy annotations. And we can see that we recover almost the same alignment as before, even with more noise added to all the data sets. So there's more to it than this first uh, hypothesis. And to give you an intuition on why uh, this works, let's first do a, a thought, a little thought experiment, where let's imagine that for our data set, we have access to the perfect uh, ground truth. And then we generate uh, this noisy ground truth with a noise centered on zero, uh, such as above here. So for each building, we have several samples of this uh, noise. 
And if we uh, optimize our alignment model on this, all these noisy ground truth, because the model is optimized with the H2 loss and it wants to minimize its overall uh, loss uh, against all the ground truth, it will have no choice but to average predictions for each uh, building. And it turns out that uh, the average corresponds to the perfect underlying ground truth. Uh, however, in our case, we only have access to one sample of the noise. So we are in the case of, of the bottom row, where we only have uh, one annotation per building. Uh, but the idea is that a, a group of buildings that look very similar will be optimized uh, similarly by the neural network. And the network will want to output the same output for all these similar uh, inputs, uh, such that there will still be this prediction averaging effect going on uh, because all these similar buildings will have uh, different uh, noisy ground truth. Uh, if we go back here to these curves, we see that we do not obtain the perfect alignment. And so I just want to show you uh, two reasons why. So the first uh, reason on the left is due to the ambiguity of the perfect ground truth annotations. So in magenta here, I showed the manually aligned annotations. And we can see that there are just four-sided polygons, which are meant to describe much more complex uh, houses. And so when the network aligned the polygons in green, uh, it might have chosen a different approximation of the same complex shape. So when we measure this alignment error, we actually measure more like an approximation error. And on the right is an actual failure case of our method. So first here, we can see that uh, the model successfully squashed vertically the red uh, polygons in order to fit the, the building in green. However, because we output smooth displacement maps, it moved both those corners in a general same direction, uh, where in fact they should have been uh, snapped together. Uh, to sum up, uh, we contributed a map alignment model with multitask learning. Uh, I also didn't mention, but we used intermediate losses inside the network to for easier optimization. Uh, we can also detect missing buildings with this added uh, segmentation map output. And finally, we use the multiple rounds training scheme to iteratively train a better model, resulting in a denoised uh, data set. Uh, as future work, we would uh, explore more about the denoising effect with the similarity measure from the neural network perspective we already defined before. Uh, and I'm especially interested in looking at the similarity between parts of buildings, like walls and corners, instead of whole patches. So during my explanation, uh, I said that there are groups of similar buildings, but I believe it's more fine scale than this, and we should look more at parts of uh, similar buildings. And now we can move on to the uh, second challenge, which is that digital maps are in vector format. Uh, so we can see on the top here uh, some example of uh, digital maps. And the vector format is a sparse shape representation, which allows for fast computations, for example, in order to compute the shortest path between any two points in a road network, or to compute the area and perimeter of a shape. Uh, it has low storage requirements. It is easy to edit, and it has uh, no pixelization when zooming, for example. However, uh, deep learning uses uh, GPUs uh, for efficiency. Uh, which do not handle vector data as well as uh, raster data, because raster data is essentially a grid of uses, uh, pixels uh, or GPUs, uh, use. for it. and uh, it is very easy to apply convolution operations uh, on top of them, for example. Uh, some related works, we uh, see two kinds of approaches uh, to solve this problem. The first kind is to use segmentation followed by vectorization. So for example, segmentation, we can use the UNET neural network that outputs a semantic map in raster format. So it takes care of the semantic part of the map making process, uh, followed by uh, vectorization, which takes care of converting this raster map into uh, the final vector format used by uh, map systems. So for vectorization, we can use the matching squares control detection algorithm, uh, followed by the Rama douglas parker simplification algorithm in order to remove uh, redundant vertices. Um, we can use the optimization of uh, mesh approximation method, or also ASIP, which uh, is the polygonal partitional uh, refinement optimization method. And the two, the second group of approaches are completely end-to-end, -end, 
So they aim to take as input the image and directly output the, the map in vector uh, format. So the first one, PolyCNN, is actually an experiment of ours where we wanted to see if it was possible to regress directly the coordinates of a four-sided polygon in order to describe the outline of an object centered on a patch. And then there's a polymapper, which uses a recurrent neural network to sequentially output the vertices of a uh, contour. And so it, it has no limitation on the number of uh, vertices. And then we have the line of work of polygon RNN, polygon RNN++, and then curve GCN. So the last one uses a graph convolutional neural network uh, to move the vertices of an initial ellipse to fit the contour of the objects centered on a detected uh, patch. So all those methods have some limitations. First, uh, compared to UNET, which is a fully convolutional neural network, they're harder uh, to train. And also there are some hard limitations. For example, they can only output one contour per object. So they cannot handle the case where there's a hole inside an object. For example, in buildings, we can have inner yards, which would require at least an interior uh, contour, or maybe sometimes uh, several interior contours. Uh, they can also not handle the case of adjoining buildings with common walls, which is quite common in uh, European city centers, for example, with buildings uh, stuck uh, together. Uh, so we first followed the, um, uh, the methods of segmentation followed by vectorization in order to uh, not have this kind of hard limitations and problems while solving their issues. And first, uh, I will show the issue number one with segmentation, which is that they have uh, rounded corners. And this is mainly due to inaccuracies in the ground truth annotations. So even if we align the ground truth annotations, with our previous method, we can still have a few pixels of misalignment. And if we have several slightly different target maps per building type or shape, such as below here, we will also have this prediction averaging effect that I already talked about for this displacement map. But here, instead of averaging displacements, we average segmentations. And when we average segmentation, uh, we obtain this uh, fuzzy or blurred uh, segmentation where the corners are rounded. And so when we apply contour detection algorithms on this, uh, we get rounded corners. So here I show three different uh, contour detection algorithms. On the top left, we have the border following uh, algorithm. On the top right, the marching squares. And the bottom left, uh, the algorithm from the library GDAL. So they all, of course, follow the rounded corners of the segmentation map. So here, segmentation maps need to be regularized in some way to, in order to have well-defined corners. And there's also a second issue, which is the local contour detection ambiguities. So here, I show a zoomed-in toy example of a perfect segmentation map where there's no blurriness. But because of the discretized um, nature of the raster map, the wall, which is meant to be uh, at a 45 degree angle, is actually sh shown to be a have a staircase uh, pattern. So the top two uh, contour detection algorithms successfully extract the wall as a 45 degree wall. But then they cut, uh, uh, here they cut all corners, and here it cuts the inner uh, corner. And the bottom uh, algorithm doesn't cut any corner. It follows the corners very precisely. However, it then follows also the staircase pattern very precisely. Uh, so all those methods at some point fail uh, somewhere. And here, knowing the contour tangent vector for each pixel would remove those ambiguities. So in order to solve both of these issues, we add an additional tangent of formation output to our segmentation neural network, which is a frame field. So I show here an example frame field. You can see it essentially aligns to the two main uh, orientations uh, of the building uh, locally. So our, we will use a, a UNET model to first output segmentation maps. So in red, we have the interior segmentation map for building. And in green, we have the map, the segmentation map for walls, and which also includes inner walls and which we, uh, we use later on in order to separate uh, buildings with common walls. And the main contribution is this added frame field in blue. 
So what are uh, frame fields? So frame field, I believe, were first used for quad meshing. So a frame field is a four polyvector field, which is locally two symmetric line fields uh, with independent scales. At each point of the 2D plane, we have four vectors, u, minus u, v, and minus v. Uh, we can see that two of those vectors are actually constrained to be the opposite of the other two. So we have more like uh, two orientations. And our goal is that one, at least one field direction aligns with the tangents of a, a contour. And the idea of using a frame field with two orientations is that it can align to both tangents uh, on either side of a building corner. Because in terms of uh, building contours, uh, they have discontinuities at corners uh, for the tangent. However, even a smooth frame field can align to uh, these discontinuities. Uh, so the frame field is encoded in two complex numbers, u and v, for each point of the 2D plane, or in our case, for each uh, pixel of the input image. However, learning u and v induces challenging issues involving labeling and sign. Because for example, if we switch u with v, it's the same frame field, or we switch v with minus u, it still represents the same frame field. So in order to have a better representation, uh, we define this f uh, polynomial here, such that the frame field directions are all roots of this polynomial. So f of u of minus u, v and minus v equals zero. And when we expand this expression, we obtain two uh, complex uh, coefficients, c0 and c2 which determine u and v up to relabeling and sign. So you can see here the expressions of C0 and C2. It doesn't matter if u becomes minus v, et cetera. And if we know C0 and C2, we can also recover uh, u and v. So it fully de determines the frame field. And so thus, we learn C0 and C2 instead of u and v because they have no uh, sign or ordering ambiguity. Uh, so the, uh, the output of the neural network would be C0 and C2 for every pixel of the input image. And in order to learn this frame field, we need two components. First, a ground truth, and then a loss function in order to see how far away our predicted frame field is from the ground truth. So as ground truth, we use the angle theta tau, which is between 0 and pi, of the unsigned tangent vector tau of the contour. So for each uh, pixel belonging to a contour annotation, uh, we can compute the exact angle of the tangent because we have access to the annotations in polygon format. And that will be our ground truth for ground truth angle for that pixel. And in order to define the loss, we will again use this f uh, polynomial and uh, specifically its amplitude. Uh, so here I plotted for fixed u and v um, directions uh, the values of the amplitude of f in blue here for all the possible angles of the input z vector. So the z vector here will be our uh, ground truth uh, unit tangent vector. And we can see that if z aligns with u or any of the other frame field directions, the amplitude is equal to zero. And if z uh, is farther away from the frame field directions, then the amplitude of f increases. So it's a perfect measure of how far away uh, the vector z is from the frame field, but it's also a measure of how far away the frame field is from this z vector. And so we will define z to be the unit vector with angle theta tau, uh, which is the angle of the uh, tangent. And then we apply this f, uh, the amplitude of f, only on edge pixels. So edge pixels have the uh, angle ground truth. So this loss aligns the frame field to tangent directions. It is small when f has a root near the uh, unit tangent vector. And it implies that one of the frame field directions aligns with tau. So this is our complete uh, training pipeline. So first, for the segmentation maps, uh, we use the regular cross entropy plus dice loss uh, for segmentation. We also add what we call a coupling loss in order to ensure that both segmentation maps agree with each other, meaning that the edge segmentation map, which represents the walls of buildings, should uh, be around the contour of the interior uh, segmentation map. We also have losses for the frame field. So we already saw the L align loss, which aligns the frame field to the ground truth tangents. We also add a smaller L align 90 loss, which aligns the field to the ground truth normals. So this is to avoid the frame field 
to collapse into a single uh, line field. And we add a L smooth loss to, uh, to force the, the smoothness of the frame field. And last but not least, we add two additional coupling losses here, uh, which aim to enforce the a correlation between segmentation maps and the frame field because they both should represent the same object. Uh, so for this, we compute the spatial gradients of the segmentation maps, and those spatial gradients should align with the frame field. So we also use this L align loss on the spatial gradients maps uh, with the together with the frame field. So here, as shown on the left, uh, a baseline uh, small unit trained only with segmentation losses. And we can observe this blob-like uh, segmentation with rounded corners and not so straight walls. And on the right is our full method with a unit with the same segmentation losses, but with this frame field uh, output added and the coupling losses. So the coupling losses between the frame field and the segmentation ensures that we obtain sharp corners and also straighter walls. So it essentially regularizes the segmentation map and it solves uh, issue number one. And now we can move on to issue number two. Uh, so here I'll show again the toy example of the zoomed in example segmentation map with uh, in green the contours uh, given by the marching squares uh, method. And we can see it cuts the corners. But now we have access to this additional frame field uh, information in blue. So we can optimize the contour in an active contours model approach to so that the contour matches the field's orientation. So after a few steps here of optimization, where we move each uh, edge of the contour to align with the frame field, we obtain our results on the right with sharp corners, but still uh, following the wall at a 45 degree angle. So it allows to disintegrate between slanted walls and corners, uh, thus solving issue number two. Here is an overview of our overall polygonization uh, pipeline. Uh, so in order to separate buildings with common walls, we actually use the wall segmentation map, which uh, is called Y edge here. And we uh, compute the skeleton image on that segmentation map, and then compute the graph of connected pixel of the skeleton image, so that we obtain here a graph of connected polylines. So we, we can see they are quite messy. However, we can, again, optimize them to align with the frame field. Uh, so it's uh, step two of the optimization, step five, uh, et cetera. And after uh, 300 steps, uh, we obtain nice uh, polylines aligning, uh, lying on the frame field and also describing walls. And now we can, the next step is to detect corners uh, of these uh, polylines, again, using the frame field. And it, Detecting corners allows us to apply a simplification algorithm only on uh, polylines between corners, such that even if we use a very high uh, tolerance value for the simplification, we, we ensure that we keep corners intact. And then we can detect polygons within this uh, planar graph and then remove polygons with a low building uh, probability value, which correspond to the background. Here, I show some uh, example uh, results. And first, we compare with two other methods on top. So the first one is ASIP, which uh, vectorizes existing uh, segmentation maps. Uh, in the middle here is Polymapper, which is the method that uses a recurrent neural network to sequentially output uh, vertices of the contour. And at the bottom is our full method with, with field learning and uh, frame field polygonization. So we can see on the left image that all methods successfully uh, extract polygons with rectangular uh, shapes. And the next three images are example images of more uh, complex buildings, which are bigger and they are also uh, more complex with possible holes in buildings and with a more complex shape than just rectangular. And we mainly see that the polymapper method, because I think it re uses a recurrent neural network, has very hard time with more complex buildings. Whereas uh, ASIP and our method uses first the segmentation and then polygonization. So the segmentation is more robust to generalize to more complex polygons. And if we look closer, our method is also more uh, regular than the ASIP one. In order to measure this regularity, 
we uh, use what we call the mean max angle error. Uh, so this is computed uh, first by uh, computing the angle of the tangents for every point of the predicted uh, polygons. And then we look at the angle of the tangent of the uh, ground truth polygon. Uh, and then we can compare the distance uh, between those two angles of predicted tangent angle and ground truth uh, tangent angle. And for uh, along the contour of a predicted polygon, we take the maximum of this angle error. And then over all the test polygons, we compute the average uh, max angle error. Uh, so here, lower is better. On the left, we have our baseline. So using units trained without any frame fill and using a simple polygonization method uh, here using marching squares, we obtain an error of 52 degrees. Uh, when we use our uh, neural network trained with frame field, but still the uh, simple polygonization method, we obtain here an error of uh, 45. So this is due to the regularizing effect of the frame field learning with sharper corners and straighter walls. Then the acid method, uh, which is 44. And then polymapper drops down uh, to 33. And our full method with frame field learning and using our own polygonization method, uh, which is uh, 32. Uh, in terms of average precision and recall, uh, so here uh, higher is better. Uh, we are uh, between Polymapper and ASIP, which uh, uses the segmentation maps of the winning entry of the corresponding change. Uh, so we still achieve reasonable results in terms of AP and AR. And uh, now we can compare also the speeds of polygon extraction. Uh, we show here the average time to extract building polygons in a 300 by 300 pixels uh, patch. Uh, so Polymapper uh, does this in 0 0.38 seconds. Uh, ASIV uh, performs it in 0 0.15 seconds, and our method takes uh, 0 0.04 seconds. So this is mainly uh, due to the fact that our polygonization, polygonization method is uh, highly parallelizable on the GPU, and so it can parallelize multiple patches in, uh, in parallel. And I'll show you here uh, an example uh, like of a more complex data set. So on the left is the baseline without frame field learning and the simple polygonization method. And on the right is our full method. So our full method uh, extracts more uh, like linear geometry uh, with less vertices. It uh, also handles some holes within the buildings. And more importantly, here we can see that it can separate some adjoining buildings uh, which have a common wall. So to sum up, uh, frame field learning adds a frame field output essentially for free. I uh, didn't say, but we only added uh, two convolutional neural networks in order to produce this uh, frame field output. Uh, it also increases segmentation performance by increasing this uh, APN AR metric. Uh, we saw that it regularizes the segmentation uh, at putting straight walls and uh, sharp corners. And finally, it allows for a fast polygonization method by providing additional shape information. And it can handle complex building topology because it uses just segmentation maps where topology is not an issue. Uh, and essentially, our polygonization method is very straightforward because it has no uh, hard decisions to make. It can only look at the frame field to know for sure what is the, the orientation of the contour. So the advantages is that the overall pipeline is uh, easy to train with local supervision signals, requiring no extensive tweaking of hopper parameters because we use just a fully convolutional neural network. And there have been method methods using, for example, generative adversarial neural networks in order to regularize the output buildings. And uh, we, we do the same regularization by using just a CNN and a few additional losses, which is a lot easier to train. Uh, and also, it's easier to train than recurrent neural networks or graph convolutional neural networks. And also, for example, recurrent neural networks need uh, to perform a beam search uh, for inference in order to find the most probable uh, sequence of vertices. Uh, additionally, uh, this frame field learning can be added to any segmentation network. Uh, it's essentially a plug-in module that you can add to your own networks. 
for overall conclusion of my presentation, uh, we used multitask learning in both our projects, and we saw that it works very well when both tasks or multiple tasks are highly correlated. Uh, in our case, we used it for alignment and segmentation, and segmentation and uh, frame field. I also want to note the importance of the loss function uh, because it can lead to a denoising effect. So we saw it with the alignment by using the L2 loss. And this is uh, contrary, for example, to the segmentation with cross entropy loss, where we saw in the second project that it led to an averaging effect on the segmentation maps, leading to a blurry segmentation maps. So sometimes the it works uh, uh, for us and sometimes against us, this averaging effect of the loss due to the imperfect ground truth. Uh, it can also be very rewarding to spend time refining uh, the loss function because it can lead to easier optimization. Uh, it can improve the quality of predictions. So we, in our case, it improved the regularity of buildings using the frame field. And it does all of these things while not increasing training or inference time. Uh, of course, uh, this is only true when we use simple functions, uh, which was uh, our case. The, the um, L align loss for the frame field is relatively very uh, straightforward. It's just arithmetics. Uh, some related perspective to our projects. First in map alignment, uh, we can imagine using a fully end-to-end -end multi-resolution approach uh, with a single network to perform alignments. Uh, here, our four networks for the four different resolutions are separated, so it's not a, uh, a complete end-to-end -end approach. And we could possibly uh, do this using a graph convolution network the graph being the polygons themselves, and then gradually moving the polygons to the aligned buildings. Uh, there's also a new uh, method that came out using a special transformer network that performs this uh, wrapping function in a differentiable uh, way, and it looks very uh, promising. For the object extraction in vector format project, uh, we can expand the frame field learning to multiple classes, uh, so an obvious way to do it would be to output a frame field for every single class. But we imagine it's very possible to use a shared uh, frame field for all classes and that aligned to the contour of uh, any class. Um, for this, it's also possible to use a six poly vector field. So we add an extra two vectors, but one uh, an extra orientation because it is needed in certain cases. Uh, especially if we use multiple classes uh, at certain intersection points between classes, we might need an extra uh, orientation. And we can do this by just adding uh, two more, for example, a W and minus W uh, to the frame field and without changing the overall uh, uh, method. And finally, uh, there is a need to add strong regularization for the final contours. So even though our final contours look clean, they might not be uh, have very regular angles or ensure a parallelity or have equal spacing, et cetera. And so the final client for uh, maps uh, needs uh, like a perfect uh, regularity of the output polygons. And finally, some broader perspectives. Uh, it would be nice to have some kind of automatic uh, quality control of a model's prediction. So because the confidence score output given by neural network is not equal to the probability of that output being the, the right one. Uh, for this, we can see uh, the example of uh, adversarial attacks, where, for example, a neural network correctly classifies an image of a school bus as a school bus, but then we can change the value of just a single pixel, and suddenly the neural network has 99% uh, confidence that it is an ostrich, uh, for example. So this confidence score of the neural network uh, is, is not enough to, in order to quantify uh, the quality of the neural network prediction. So we have to find ways to guarantee the performance of a network in order and to know where and when, in which case it might fail. Uh, also, neural networks would benefit from having the ability to reason. So a uh, common failure case in remote sensing 
is when we have a parking lot uh, on top of uh, a building. So the, on the image, it just looks as a parking lot. So the neural network uh, correctly segments it as a parking lot, but then completely misses the building beneath it. And as humans, we can maybe look at visual cues in the image, such as a shadow, or if the image has some angle, we can maybe see some of the facade of the building uh, in order to infer that, yes, there's a parking lot, but there's also a building underneath this parking lot. So there's been some work uh, to add this reasoning ability to neural networks, for example, graph reasoning on detected objects, or um, in remote sensing, there's this visual question answering uh, method that go toward this uh, direction. So here, uh, I showed the list of uh, papers that were published during my three years of uh, PhD. And finally, uh, here's the link to my uh, GitHub where I uploaded uh, all the codes of uh, every project uh, of the PhD and it's completely public and I encourage you to check it out and, and use it if, if you find it useful. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your nice presentation. So now we are going to start up the question session. Okay. So we'll wait for some time to start up the session. So we're going to ask uh, to Lorenzo Bruno the repeat of our question. Okay, can you hear me? Can we hear? Yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Lorenzo. Wait. Uh, just give us two seconds. Nicola, this microphone. I think it's better now. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I'd like to start, uh, and uh, I'd like to start congratulating with you because uh, I think this is uh, a very interesting uh, thesis and a very interesting work that you have developed uh, along your thesis. Uh, this is uh, uh, first something which is very timely. I think uh, the topic is really uh, relevant, uh, important, and uh, okay. Looking from the perspective of remote sensing, maybe less study with respect uh, to other. Uh, topics that maybe are more popular, but uh, very important. And uh, you have addressed this uh, with the proper methodological approach. This is very clear reading the thesis, uh, which is also, uh, let's say, across machine learning uh, and, uh, and uh, let's say, different uh, concepts that are not uh, machine learning concepts, of course, uh, which is uh, something that uh, I think helped uh, to find solutions that are uh, uh, really relevant. Uh, also, the, the novel contribution, I think, are uh, very significant. So uh, the, the two main, uh, let's say, proposed approaches uh, are uh, really interesting uh, from the methodological perspective, also from the impact uh, that uh, they can have uh, in, uh, in terms of application. And I appreciated in the thesis also all the analysis that you have done in terms of experimental results, uh, which uh, is a, a proper val validation what uh, has been done then okay reading the thesis uh, okay it, uh, i think uh, that uh, sometimes the chapters are not uh, really at the same uh, at the same levels uh, but probably this has been also a choice of using uh, material from from other papers and uh, uh, let's say that uh, uh, i would have been appreciated to have also a little bit more of critical analysis on drawbacks of uh, the different approaches uh, uh, okay, you pointed out some developments, uh, maybe uh, having a little bit more analysis of that uh, would that be help the reader to, to understand also the, the, the limitation that, that uh, you have identified, that I'm sure you have identified in your, uh, in your methods. So uh, apart from uh, this uh, general uh, okay, overview, I have, of course, uh, Few, few questions just to enter a little bit more in detail of what uh, you have uh, done in the thesis uh, and also you have presented uh, today. And uh, I'd like to start with the, the first part that you have presented, which is uh, interesting and uh, also in terms of, of the results that, uh, that you have obtained. And my first quest question is related uh, to the iterative approach that you use. 
you commented and showed some uh, uh, results uh, of what you can achieve starting from, of course, a different condition with simulation. So uh, my question is, uh, uh, did you try to study if there is any, let's say, theoretical condition that uh, uh, can guarantee that you converge to a proper solution with your iterative approach? I mean, this is, a, is do you think is there is a, uh, a way for uh, having some indication of what you should expect. Uh, and uh, on the other end, uh, did you find uh, what is the, 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 the limit? I mean, uh, you have presented the results uh, with simulated data that show that after iteration after iteration you improve. With respect, uh, did you find, uh, uh, I mean, what is the condition where uh, the, the iterative approach can uh, fail in improving the, the, the performances? Okay. Um... So our hypothesis of uh, the, this multiple one training scheme working is that the noise is centered on the ground truth underlying annotations. So if the noise, uh, it has some bias, uh, then it will average out the, the non-biased uh, displacement, but then it will, there will still be like a com constant uh, displacement remaining. Uh, so I guess, that that could fail in this in, in this case. Um, also, I mean, I, we have not observed very strong failure case for the alignment where the building might be completely uh, in a different direction. Uh, however, I think if the the input displacement is just too large, for example, if the building is is really very far away from the uh, building in the image, uh, it might fail in this case. So, the, the, what do you mean with uh, large? Have you any? Experience? If it's large, so we, when we design our um, multi resolution pipeline, uh, we design it with this uh, maximum displacement that we observed in the images, which was uh, 27 pixels in our case. So we design our pipeline to handle up to 32 pixels of maximum displacement. Uh, but then if the, um, we have an input uh, displaced uh, misaligned polygon, which is farther away than 32 pixels, uh, we, we cannot, in a sense, guarantee the, the output. It, it might perform less well on more misaligned data. Uh, oh, yes, sir. However, in that case, so the solution would be to add an even, like a, another scale, a course of scale, and network train uh, with a downscaling, stronger downscaling factor to go, for example, up to uh, 64 pixels of placement. But so do you expect, you expect that, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the hypothesis that you have done uh, is a reliable hypothesis uh, for many real applications? So I think it's only one of, the, the hypothesis of a, of a centered noise is just one of them. Uh, it's one that we identified. Uh, may, maybe there are more, uh, but we haven't identified uh, those. Yes. So uh, if I correctly understood, you, you assume that uh, uh, anyway, the noise is from a single distribution uh, and is characterized uh, uh, by single, by single, let's say, source of noise. Uh, is this something that uh, I understood correctly? Uh, so it could have uh, several uh, sources of errors, as long as they are all uh, a, uh, an average noise, noise of zero or a centered noise around the zero displacements. So even if there's more sources, uh, as long as the resulting noise or resulting distribution is centered on zero, uh, then this denoising effect should still uh, happen. And in fact, in our case, we don't know exactly the, all the sources of errors. Uh, so we observed that it is mainly due to this auto rectification error, but it can also uh, be from just pure annotation and precision for, from humans. So we train our uh, our method on these OpenStreetMap annotations, uh, which were uh, obtained by humans uh, annotating satellite images or RLO images, uh, which also have a certain annotation error. 
uh, and so they annotate on an orthorectified image, which itself might be misaligned with our own orthorectified image. So that's why there's this orthorectification error, but there's also this human error in annotation. And there might be even more errors, as in say, but there are also errors of the atmosp atmospheric effects, uh, including remote sensing images for satellites. Uh, so as long as all those errors have a mean of zero, uh, then we still have the noising effect going on. And I also suspect that our first hypothesis of a perfect ground truth uh, having even a small fraction of perfect ground truth in the data sets might be enough to remove any bias that remains in a noisy misaligned data set. And what do you mean with a small portion? So if we imagine a certain proportion of perfect aligned annotations and all the others are misaligned with this uh, zero mean noise, then the misaligned annotations will average out. Ah, oh, sorry. Uh, if we have a fraction of perfectly aligned annotations and another even maybe a bigger fraction of uh, noisy annotations, even if the noisy annotation have a certain bias, uh, this bias might be corrected by these uh, well-aligned annotations. But that's just, that's what I speculate, but I'm not sure. Okay. So uh, you mentioned that, uh, okay, this can be very useful for extracting uh, reference data for, for training, for example, uh, a, a, a deep learning uh, architecture. But I, I, one question that, uh, that I have is, uh, 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 what do you expect uh, uh, is the effect of uh, possible changes that you have? Uh, because maps uh, can be obsolete. Uh, maybe you have new images and you try to match, and uh, you have that uh, there are uh, many buildings that are changed, or anyway, a significant number of buildings that are changed. Yes. What that, do you expect uh, it will happen with your approach? Uh, so with our approach, we can segment new buildings, which are not in the original uh, map with this additional segmentation map. However, we cannot uh, delete buildings which might have been destroyed, for example. And in a case where a building changes in shapes, or maybe there's a, an additional extension of a building, uh, yeah, I'm not sure in that case how, how it will work. And maybe it will align. It will try to align the old building with the new shape, but in a smooth manner. So it, it will not uh, align all the points along the contour to the new contour. It will try to, to find a smooth displacement to align the annotation. Uh, so it will still remain the old building, but uh, more well aligned to the new one. So there will not be, we cannot add this new extension that was built, for example, uh, to extend the old building. Okay, so so you did not have this case in your uh, uh, in your images in the test that you did. So maybe there's this case, but it's uh, the data set doesn't have this information, so we didn't we did not look uh, for this case. Um, so there we saw cases of. Um, uh, buildings appearing or disappearing, but we didn't look for the case where building changed shapes or there's an additional uh, uh, wing, for example, of, uh, of a building. Okay. So I have another question related uh, to, to the losses that you define and to the weighting of the different contribution. Can you elaborate a little better how you define this weighting of the different contributions? Uh, so is it still for the alignment project? Yeah. Or, so for the alignment project, we have uh, losses for the interior of building. We have losses for the, the walls of building uh, and also the corners of buildings. And, and of, of course, the, the displacement map itself. And uh, uh, we applied, so the, um, I mean, there are two kinds of coefficients. So first is the coefficients to uh, apply more loss to the corners of buildings because they have very well-defined uh, displacements. 
and to apply a bit less loss to the walls of buildings because they, we can only define their displacements in one dimension. And inside buildings and outside buildings, uh, there's no really displacements uh, defined. So that's why we, we increase the coefficients for uh, corner pixels uh, to learn the displacements. And as to the choice of which uh, coefficients to use, uh, we, we only use a scaling of 10 between uh, those classes of coefficients. So the entire of buildings might have a coefficient of 0 0.1, the walls have a coefficient of 1, the corners have a coefficient of 10. It's completely arbitrary. Uh, we didn't test any other combination of coefficients. Uh, so it, it's, it's possible to perform a grid search on this kind of hardware parameters, but it's, it's very expensive. So as long as it's uh, as it worked for us, we, we didn't change that. Okay. I guess that this uh, changing that can impact significantly on the final result. So, or is this uh, something that you expect is not so important? Mm. I think because the loss for the corners are so much higher, so it's 10 times the loss of the wall and it's 100 times the loss of inside buildings. I don't think it will make much, uh, uh, it will have much impact. Um, but it's hard to say. Yeah. Okay, but what hap does it happen if you remove one of the losses uh, with low weight? Uh, it's a good question. I haven't tried that. Because I mean, if you say, okay, there is a big difference, uh, I can expect that uh, the impact of this contribution to the loss uh, uh, can be less less relevant. It's uh, so maybe it could be interesting to, to understand that if uh, you are really exploiting all the, 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 the losses or at the given point, if there is a large difference, uh, there is some, uh, some different effect that uh, dominate in, in the convergence. Hmm. Maybe it's very possible that if we use only the corner loss, it still works. Uh, but in my mind, if we use only the, the loss on corners, it's as a, a lot lower amounts of uh, um, pixels. So the, the pixel corners, uh, there's not a lot of them. So that's why I still included losses on the edge of uh, buildings and entry of buildings. But it would be interesting to, to try. Yeah, I, I have a final question on this part, uh, which is uh, related uh, to, uh, I, can you mention uh, uh, what are the main limitations of this approach? Uh, what, 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 if there are drawbacks uh, that uh, you presented uh, clearly, what are the advantages? And uh, do, do you think there are uh, some uh, hidden drawbacks that uh, should be pointed out? Yeah, I think the biggest drawback is that we use uh, four neural networks for four different resolutions. And each network is relatively big. So for inference time, we need the inference time of four networks in succession. So even if those networks can be trained in parallel, uh, the inference time uh, takes a toll for, uh, for this lot. That's why in the perspective, I would imagine using a single neural network, but that still performs this multi-resolution alignment uh, because I believe multi-resolution is needed for very large displacements. Uh, but if a single neural network can do it, uh, that would be better, especially because every single network in the multiple uh, resolution pipeline has also a multiple resolution uh, approach inside because it has pooling operations, et cetera, to downscale further the, the segmentation map. Um, so for me, that's the, the biggest drawback I see. And also the whole system is relatively hard to train. Uh, learning um, displacements is, I mean, I found it's hard to optimize the networks uh, for that. So if there's a better architecture that trains better, it, it will be a lot nicer. So you selected UNET as a backbone. Do you consider other possibilities before going to UNET? So, so no, we didn't consider or tried other possibilities. I think UNET is a very nice, um, architecture that you can build on top. So for example, you can use 
different encoders, but still use these uh, skip connections. And it has uh, proven to be very effective in, in various, uh, um, for various tags. Uh, so that's why we, we use that pretty much. Okay, uh, moving to the, to the second contribution that, uh, that you have uh, presented, which is, uh, in my opinion, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, yes, I have a question related uh, to the many losses that uh, that you have introduced, uh, and uh, on uh, the, the I mean uh, the, the combination, the optimization of all these different losses. Can you, uh, you elaborate a little bit better this uh, point? Uh, so yes, so in total we have eight losses. So we we have to write have eight coefficients, or in reality seven coefficients, but we uh, we have eight to to scale each of those losses, and it's very difficult to to combine all those losses. I think it's the main challenge for multitask learning. So multitask learning is very rewarding, but it's difficult to to weight uh, those losses. So our approach was to normalize each loss, so to find out uh, experimentally on the data sets uh, the, the scale of each loss on a few uh, thousand samples uh, and then we can normalize each loss uh, independently and i found it's easier to to use normalized losses but then between those normalized losses we still need to find uh, the coefficients for each loss and and this is still done by hand by trial and error mainly by uh, adding one loss at a time so we first um, use the segmentation loss to learn segmentation. Once uh, it works, we can add the uh, frame field loss and try different values and, uh, and stop where it works. So I didn't also perform grid search, uh, but it's still a bit challenging to, to find the right coefficients. Uh, also, I mean, one final thought is that in our case, the multitask learning, uh, the, the, all the tasks were very correlated to each other. The frame field and the segmentation are not in competition with each other. So I think in this case, uh, it's easier to, to weight the losses compared to cases where we have two tasks which are essentially competing for some capacity of the network. And where if one uh, coefficient of a loss from, for one loss is too high, the other one will not learn. So at least in our case, uh, this effect is, is much more limited. Okay, but uh, did you investigate any other strategy, hierarchical strategy, to understand if there is a, a, a different approach for uh, the optimization that uh, can, uh, let's say, better serve your purposes? Uh, do you mean to find the different coefficients for all the losses or something even different? No, uh, Brian, but, uh, try to understand if you have, for example, a multi-stage uh, learning phase where uh, uh, focusing uh, on the different losses in a different way, maybe in a hierarchical way, or trying to understand uh, some alternative strategies with respect to, to a research that I expect becomes uh, anyway un unfeasible in probably from the computational viewpoint. Um, I'm not sure I, I understand the question. Uh, do you mean other strategies to learn both tasks or? Yeah, uh, I mean other strategy in uh, then finding a, a proper optimization of all the loss fun functions uh, uh, without having a sequential uh, approach because if I correctly understood you had the sequential approach to the optimization. Uh, so no, this sequential approach is only uh, done by me when uh, finding out, uh, I mean, when building the architecture and the training process. But once that is done, if someone else wants to, uh, to train uh, one, of one of our network on a new data set, they, they can just use the same uh, coefficients um, so the, the training process is not done uh, sequentially. Uh, all the losses are applied uh, uh, and with the, with the defined uh, coefficients. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. My, my point was try to understand if the you uh, investigated the other ways for weighting differently, the different losses uh, uh, in an efficient way from the, the, the computational viewpoint. Okay, so yeah, when I encountered this problem of having eight losses, uh, so I looked a little bit on uh, state of the art methods uh, on papers that maybe already solved these issues. And there have been some work uh, in this direction, uh, but to me, they didn't re really um, apply in our case. So there's one work that aims to uh, measure the, the speed of convergence for each loss differently. And um, if one loss, uh, and for them, I mean, they have, a, it was slightly a different uh, uh, case because they had like a hard uh, task to train and an easy task. Uh, and so the easy task will, optimize very fast. And so they would, when they saw that it would optimize too fast, they will uh, reduce its speed of convergence by reducing its uh, coefficients in order to train the hard task. But there's also another approach that did the reverse that said, oh, if we have a task that learns fast, we should prioritize this task uh, for training. Um, so I didn't really find both of this uh, method satisfactory. And also, they were a bit uh, uh, more involved to to implement and would add more complexity. So, in our case, we have very uh, correlated tasks that should not really compete with each other. Uh, so that's why uh, I chose not to, to use those methods in the end. Okay, uh, I have a, another question on the on the training data that you use because. Uh, in, in this case, you assume that you have a perfectly annotated data for the training. Is this correct? Uh, for the, the well, it also works actually with non-perfect data. Uh, we actually train with uh, without corrected data. Uh, so, because if we do not add this frame field, we observe this blurred uh, segmentation output due to the to the small noise in the ground truth. Uh, so we still learn with non-perfect data. Okay, but do you expect that uh, this uh, angle of the tangent vector can be uh, something that uh, is, uh, let's say, less, uh, less affected by the, the poor annotation or? Uh, or yes, exactly. yes, you're right. Uh, if the annotation is displaced by a few pixels, it, it doesn't change the ground truth for the frame field. Uh, so it just, changes the location of where that ground truth is. But since we optimize the, the frame field to be smooth, uh, the frame field we have essentially the same direction at the, the real corner, uh, the real wall of the uh, building, even if the ground truth is a bit, a few meters to the right or to the left of the wall. So that's the, the nice thing about the frame field is that it is indeed robust to some misalignment in the ground truth annotation. Okay, and how many training samples did you use for your test? Uh, for the, for example, so we, we use different data sets. Mm -hmm. but the the, the, one that is during the presentation was yeah. for the broad AI data set. It's uh, 60,000 uh, patches of 300 by 300 uh, pixels. Okay, uh, I have the same question also here for uh as uh, in the previous case what is the, the 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 let's say the 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 most critical part that remain in this method in your opinion what is the let's say the the, the drawback uh, that uh, uh you can point out on the basis of what you have done and your experience with this hmm. so for us the, the final step would be to add very strong regularization on the output polygons uh, because even so the frame field adds a regularization for the segmentation. It has some regularization for the, the walls being uh, more straight because of this uh, smoothness uh, loss on the frame field. Uh, but then if two rectangle, rectangle, rectangular buildings are next to each other, there's no guarantee that they, they are perfectly parallel with each other. Uh, so we, we need a method to add this hard uh, uh, regularization constraints, such as parallelity or 
regulative angles. For example, if you have a, a building with a, like a semicircle, for now, we, we don't guarantee that it's a perfect semicircle. Uh, it, it will follow the, the segmentation and the frame field will align to this semicircle, but then geometrically, uh, there's no guarantee that it, it is actually follows a semicircle and other regulators like this. Okay. Okay, uh, maybe I can move to, to, to let's say, a, a final, more general question to give space then to the others. And uh, my final question is uh, really very general, and I'd like to understand uh, uh, from your perspective what what uh, uh, you think is the the, the, the best uh, contribution, the most relevant contribution in your work, uh, selecting one uh, uh, among uh, the, the, the presented in the thesis. And I also would like to understand what is, uh, let's say, the, the part in which you are less uh, less happy with respect to the initial perspective. Maybe you expect something more in uh, some activity that you have developed and you did not reach uh, the, the results that were expected. Mm. Uh, so I guess the, um, the main contribution is really this frame field output, uh, which allows to add this new sort of geometric information output to the neural network. Uh, but it does this uh, still by using a fully convolutional neural network. Uh, so which are really made I mean, uh, to be used very efficiently on GPU. Um, and for the the part I'm less uh, happy about, uh, I, I tried actually um, uh, on the perspective I mentioned to use a fully end-to-end -end, uh, model for image uh, alignment or for the alignment of polygons. So I tried using a graph convolution neural network to align polygons uh, over the buildings. Uh, but I, I couldn't finish the, I mean, at some point I had to move away from image alignment and to try something new and to try to solve this second challenge. So there's some unfinished uh, work there uh, that would be nice to, to come back to. Okay, I have just a very last question. Uh, uh, it's related, I see that you have published many uh, conference paper in very good conferences. Uh, but I did not see uh, peer-reviewed papers on uh, on journal. Do you expect? Are you working on that? Because I think that uh, many of these uh, contribution could be uh, really worth to be published also on uh, peer-reviewed journals. Uh, so I think we focused on uh, conferences because they are in computer vision. They, they are uh, let's say more. Uh, matter more than journals, let's say. But maybe in remote sensing, it would make sense to publish a journal. So this is not, uh, so we don't currently uh, have a paper in, in the review process for that. Okay, so thank you very much again. I think this was a very interesting, very good work. Thank you. Thanks a lot uh, for the question. So now this is the tour of uh, Nicolas Cortier, which is professor at Iriza, to ask question. Thanks. Do you, uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. So first of all, uh, well, I, I'd like uh, first to thank uh, Julia for inviting me to uh, participate to this uh, jury. So uh, thanks, because the work is uh, very uh, interesting. and. Uh, and thanks, Nicola, also for the for the quality of your work, the quality of your PhD document that I really enjoyed to, uh, to read, that uh, I learned uh, many things, and also the quality of the presentation uh, that was also very good. And uh, well, um, apart from that, so I have I have some technical uh, questions about uh, about your work, and maybe some things that were not very clear in the document. I, I'd like to. Uh, to ask uh, to ask them to you uh, now, so uh, I will deep uh, rapidly uh, deep into the technical uh, aspects of your work. So uh, sorry, maybe about uh, about this, but uh, 
Okay, so first, uh, my first question is about uh, the ar architecture that you defined into the uh, misalignment uh, part, so on, on the first project yeah, that you described. So you, uh, you add, uh, uh, you made the choice of a multi-resolution framework where a UNET is uh, uh, used at different uh, resolution of, of your work. So uh, I would like uh, that you comment maybe about something that was not clear. So is it the same uh, UNET architecture that it, that it is used throughout the resolution? And uh, is there a kind of uh, mechanism of weight sharing between those different units, or do you learn four different uh, units uh, separately? Uh, so in our case, we use the, the same architecture, uh, but with different weights. So there's no weight sharing, and they are all trained independently uh, from each other. OK. And uh, why did you not consider weight sharing? Because Maybe you can think that some of the detecting part of the unit is likely to be good also at different uh, resolution, no? or it might also adapt to uh, images that do not share the same uh, re resolution in the first place. Uh, so I think, yes, some features can be shared between uh, some of the resolution. Uh, I think mainly we didn't try this because even if they are shared shared weight, it doesn't affect the final uh, inference time. And so, in our view, might as well uh, use four different neural networks, which would be very specialized to a single resolution, uh, so, so that they perform maybe even uh, a bit better than uh, shared networks. I think that's the main reason. Okay, and, and so you, you made the choice of uh, dividing this re resolution aspect into four uh, four blocks. So I was wondering why four blocks. Maybe is it related to the fact that you are limiting the size of the and you are constraining the um, the displacement field to be uh, no larger than a, a few amount of pixels, or why this choice? Uh, actually, yes, exactly. So for at each scale. We wanted to constrain the, the amplitude of the alignment to four pixels. Uh, I mean, between minus four and, and plus four pixels in other directions. And in order uh, to still handle uh, overall uh, this alignment of 32 pixels, because that was our aim as we observed this alignment of around 27 pixels maximum. Uh, so that's why we use four different scales, uh, each uh, handling four pixels. But of course, a scale with a downscaling factor of two actually handles uh, eight pixels in the original orientations, the uh, or, original uh, resolution. And we also wanted to have some overlap uh, between each scale, so that even if the the coarser scale uh, that does not achieve uh, its full alignment, the next scale can still uh, there's still some overlap in the amplitude that. Okay, okay. So yeah, I guess this question of multi-resolution is interesting uh, when it comes uh, when we come to the fact that you might have a problem also of uh, uh, overfitting over the type of image where you are doing the the learning and the type of image where where you are testing. So I know that in, in your in your document you try to uh, learn on some part of. Uh, some uh, image and then try on onto another uh, image coming from another data set. And it's much more difficult to do so rather than learning on one part of an image uh, and trying to test on the other part of the image, which is m much more easy in, in, in my opinion. So uh, this issue is, is related, I mean, it, it is known as maybe machine learning as the domain adaptation problem. And I think that uh, clearly uh, you, you can encounter those kinds of problems in uh, in your uh, in your setting, yeah. and um, well, it, it comes to my mind that this uh, adaptation problem it might come also with respect to the height uh, of the of the captor I and mean, the height of the satellite. And uh, so, if you have this uh, multi-resolution scheme, um, uh, I would say wired for a given uh, specific uh, distance of the satellite to the uh, surface that is uh, observed. 
I mean, do you would you adapt to uh, maybe uh, a different height or uh, like having a different spatial resolution in the in the image? I, I'm not sure that in, in the data set that you tested, there's a, a big difference in terms of uh, GSD uh, between the data sets. Yes. So in the data set that we trained and tested for, uh, there were uh, most of the images were at 0 0.3 meters of uh, GSD. Um, but some of them were at 0 0.6 and maybe, and I think that's it. Or so, oh no, some of them were a bit between the two. So we actually rescaled all the images to be, uh, to have 0 0.3 meters of a ground scale distance uh, so that we, we ensure we didn't have this problem. Uh, but then as, as you said, we, we train our networks on aerial images of, of the 0 0.3 meters, but we also tested on the uh, satellite image uh, on the part for a 2.5D building web construction. Um, and it still worked to some extent on that image. Uh, but of course, it, it would be better to train on the resolution of the test image. And especially if test images maybe have a GSD of 10 meters, uh, I don't expect uh, like our method to our to train model on different resolutions to work. But of course, I mean, the, we have a model trained at 0 0.3 meters, but then the, the scale before that is trained at 0 0.6, and the scale before that at 1.2, and the one, the final one at 2.4. Uh, so you can reuse some of the pre-trained models, but you have not have to train all the models at coarser scales. Mm. Okay. Okay. So um, what I found interesting in this uh, in this part is the the fact that you are learning a, a displacement field. Uh, and I was wondering, so I think this is a remark that I have done in my uh, in the, in the review of your document. I was wondering why you did not include um, a regularization of this displacement field as you have done uh, with the frame field uh, approach. Mm. So, so yeah. yeah, more specifically, I think that if you are not constraining the type of uh, frame of uh, displacement field, you you can have uh, strong uh, divergences in this uh, in this displacement field, and you, you can have collapse of some parts. Or so, so yeah, I, I, I would like that. Yeah, you comment at this at this point. Yeah, so we didn't want to use any regularization of the displacement field because in some cases, uh, two buildings next to each other might not have the uh, very like the same displacement. If, for example, the uh, Two buildings were from two different uh, data sets, and they were all imported uh, on in OpenStreetMap. Uh, they might not have the same type of error uh, in the misalignment, so we didn't want to constrain ourselves on a certain kind of uh, of regularity of the displacement. Uh, so that's why we didn't enforce, for example, smoothness of the displacement field or or uh, positive uh, divergence or anything like this. Uh, however, in practice, we observed that the frame field that is produced is still uh, smooth uh, because we generated smooth uh, displacements uh, for the for the ground truth. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, but you you did enforce this uh, regularity for the frame field. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, what's what's the argument for doing it in the case of frame field and not doing it uh, in the case of uh, displacement? So, yeah. So in the case of frame field, uh, we saw that even a, fr a smooth frame field can still align to discontinuities in the building contour because of its uh, uh, inner structure because it's, uh, it contains two orientations. Um, so in the case. The first, there's no drawback to, to having a smooth frame field, but in addition, uh, having a smooth frame field allows us to regularize for uh, walls of, of buildings. Uh, so that's why in our case, it was, uh, we thought it was beneficial to have this uh, smooth frame field. Okay, okay, okay. Um, let me check my notes. Uh, okay, so yeah, you did, 
in order to generate the ground proof, you, you did this, um, I mean, you model the possible displacement as a uh, 2D uh, Gaussian uh, displacement. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, like the gradient of a 2D uh, Gaussian uh, uh, scalar, uh, scalar field, if I'm correct. So I was wondering if uh, this choice is related in some ways into the type of uh, displacement that would in occur in real life especially in like if you have some atmospheric uh, uh, diffractions or uh, such type of uh, geometry i mean such type of effects of the geometric deformation of the of the image so is, is it i mean is, is this choice has, has been made because it was a simple way to model the, the displacement or because it was grounded into uh, the fact that it, it well approximates the true uh, types of displacement that you have in your image. Uh, so it was more because of the, the first, uh, uh, the first uh, ID is that it's, uh, it's easy to generate, but it, can, it encompasses a large um, possibilities of uh, different displacements. We actually we use several Gaussians with random, uh, like a random center on the x and y axis, and with a random um, amplitude and and random uh, uh, variability, uh, and then we we generate multiple uh, of those Gaussian uh, fields which are added together to obtain a single uh, displacement map. Uh, such that we can even have uh, rotations or scaling of the displacements. So for us, it was an easy way to obtain very, uh, like a lot of different kinds of displacements. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not uh, directly related to any real-world uh, displacements. So, so as, as you said in the in the part on uh, denoising, you said that okay, because we have a, a ground truth which is such that uh, in average uh, the solution is the correct one so it, it's clearly related uh, as far as i understand it's, it's clearly related to the fact that because you have this gaussian uh, structure of the of the of the displacement field you you can recover the this uh, averaging uh, property in your uh, in, uh, in the network right uh, yes it's because the output so the loss on the output is this is just a L2 distance for each uh, pixel compared to the, 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 the ground truth. So when we, so the target is the noisy uh, ground truth, it's the noisy annotation. And so when it, it averages out the, the displacement to get to this noisy target. And so it, it's, in the end, it points to this uh, the average uh, noisy ground truth, which corresponds to the underlying perfect ground So okay. Okay, okay, okay. And so this is maybe something you, you did not explore, but um, is the multi-resolution scheme also contributing to this uh, denoising uh, effect? Because it, it has also an, an effect of uh, I think uh, averaging across uh, across space this uh, this multi-resolution. I, I, I don't know. Did you consider that maybe it was one of the sources of the denoising effect? Um, so I didn't consider that. I'm not sure it is the case. So in the case of the designing uh, denoising effect, I, I view the whole multi-resolution as just as just one 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 model. Uh, I think a model, I mean, we, if, we still are, if, we, if we had like a, a single model uh, that performed alignment in a single step, still trained with the same pattern of uh, this L2 loss for the displacement path, uh, there's no reason for it not to work. I, think. Uh, I don't think the multi resolution approach has any effect on the denoising. Okay, okay. 
Uh, last final um, technical question on this part. So uh, you, you said that you, you constrain the magnitude of the displacement to be uh, like in, in the first experiment to be uh, between minus four and uh, plus four uh, pixels. Mm. How do you do it uh, numerically? I mean, are you clamping the, 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 the norm of the displacement vectors or? Uh. I think so. When I generate displacement maps, I use multiple Gaussians, uh, both um, for the x uh, displacement and the y uh, displacement. And then once I add all them up, I normalize it to plus four and minus four pixels. Okay, but this is for the generation of the ground truth, but for the output of the network, for for, for the, for As the, the output of the network, it's uh, it outputs in plus one minus one. With like a uh, hyperbolic tangent, uh, uh, okay. Okay. and then multiply by by four. Okay, 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 okay. Thanks. Okay, now coming to the second part uh, of the of your work. So you, you just a small question because you presented the fact that okay, if you average a lot of segmentation maps, then you can you you get this blurry effect that it, that is difficult to polygonize uh, afterward. You, I mean, the example was nice, but um, when I saw it, I thought, but okay, people that come from image processing, they would just consider like morphological operators to, uh, to increase the sharpness of, the, of this blurry uh, shape. Uh, so is it not a, a solution that would be uh, interesting to uh, consider instead of yeah, going uh, straight into uh, deep uh, learning networks. I mean, just just doing uh, more some opening and closure operations to to sharpen the border of the of the segmentation maps, and after that, do the polygonization. Mm. So, with those kind of operations, we could remove the the blurness in terms of a value of pixels. So, between background pixels and uh, fully building pixels, there's some like uh, we, we would want a step function, but it's more like uh, similar to the sigmoid, I would say, like with a, a blurred uh, edge. So we could sharpen that, but it will not sharpen the geometry of the rounded corners. Uh, so, and that's the most important part. So when I say blurred image, it's more that it's, it also blurs the, the geometric features uh, of corners, which is not possible to recover. And, but if we had the systematic operation to convert rounded corners into sharp ones, then we would also sharpen uh, curved uh, features of buildings, uh, which are in reality, uh, in reality curved. So uh, we, use, we need deep learning to differentiate between actual corner and a, a curved wall, for example, of a building or, or some circular uh, shapes around building. Okay, 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 I get the answer. So, okay, re regarding the frame field part, so I, I, I do uh, share my, uh, my comments with, uh, um, with the previous uh, uh, reviewer. That is, that it's a really interesting part, and uh, really, I think it's uh, maybe, um, yes, the part of, the, of your work that is uh, um, maybe open to a, uh, uh, the the most uh, I mean the biggest number of um, uh, future work and uh, maybe use in other settings in the in the remote sensing community and also in, in in computer vision I guess but okay but to me at the same time okay uh, if you look at uh, problems that uh, are, or are occurring in medical imaging. Uh, you have this kind of, uh, I don't know if you, you know about this, but you, you have these kinds of sensors, MRI sensors that are called uh, diffusion tensor uh, sensors, uh, MRI techniques. So basically you are, I mean, it's more specifically for uh, observing the, the, the brain, uh, uh, you are measuring a kind of tensors in a voxel uh, uh, structure. So I know that at Sophia Antipolis, there's a lot of uh, people working on this uh, on, on this topic. So did you make the connection with those kinds of, of data where you, in each pixel you have a tensor instead of having a scalar uh, scalar value? And uh, uh, 
because I know that they also uh, uh, worked on segmentation uh, process that are working, I mean, specific level sets that are working in this uh, diffusion tensors uh, image room. So, I mean, is there, are there some kind of connections with those types of work? So maybe it's out of the, of the bibliography that you've been studying uh, maybe during your thesis, but. Uh, so I don't know yeah, about this works, but so for each voxel, there's a, a tensor, tensor yeah. but is it, does it represent multiple directions? Yeah. So it, it, it basically it represents, uh, I mean, it's more or less the same as a frame field, but in a, in a three, di three dimension because it's a, a, a voxel, but uh, yeah, it's basically the, 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 same, the same idea, I guess. Uh, maybe there are some subtle differences, but. Uh, ah, okay. But it's. Uh, yeah, for frame field, I mean, frame fields and also like general poly vector fields, et cetera. Uh, so I saw some work. Uh, for 3D frame fields uh, to maybe mesh the inside of a 3D objects. So it's more in, in the graphical community that it comes from. Uh, there are several applications in 2D and uh, 3D surfaces, but also 3D volumes. But uh, as for MRI, I haven't, I don't know, I don't know much about that. Okay. Okay. So uh, in, in the framework, in the network that you designed, uh, you are expressing a loss that is uh, computed between the spatial gradients that are evaluated from the segmentation maps and the, uh, the, the orientation information we, we, that is given by the frame field. So my question is, are, uh, is it reliable to rely on the spatial gradients actually? Because, well, it depends on the way you are uh, uh, computing them, but so I, I would like that, okay, do you use like a finite difference with uh, special neighbors or do you, do you use like a, a kind of, uh, uh, I, I don't know, uh, convolution uh, with a, a Laplacian uh, operator? Or what, what do you use to, uh, to compute those gradients? And is this operation not to, uh, I mean, I mean the, the design of this operation, I think it's somehow critical with respect to the quality of the loss uh, in this case. Yeah, so um, you're right. I mean, I try to find the best method to compute those spatial gradients. Um, while still, I mean, it needs to be fast to, to work in a network and it needs to be differentiable. So it's based on, on convolutions. Uh, so instead of using the a Laplace uh, kernel, I use a shore uh, the kernel, uh, which is meant to to be more robust to this uh, discretized nature of the segmentation map to give the most correct uh, uh, gradient. But of course, on the pixel laying exactly on the corner, it, it gives um, like a diagonal uh, yeah. gradient vector. But, but then that's the only one for the other ones. It, it gives the right uh, approximation. Okay, 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 okay. And uh, okay, next uh, yes, and then ne next part about this uh, the, the, this frame field. So I, I would like that we come back onto this idea of smoothness of the of the frame field. So I think it's a clearly a, a major component in uh, in why your, the method is uh, succeeding in finding the the right polygon uh, after that. Because okay, you can recover straight lines and things like that because you have this. Uh, this smoothness uh, assumption. So I have two questions. So maybe in, in the case where you have a lot uh, of textures in your uh, in your image, I mean, is it still possible to uh, correctly estimate the, the, the frame field? Or do you need to really regularize very strongly the, the, the frame field to, uh, uh, so that you, you can get rid of this small uh, texture, uh, textural uh, effect? Mm -hmm. And uh, the second part of the question is that uh, the frame field is only useful on the contours of the, the buildings and the things that you, you want to detect. But maybe the estimation of the frame field is less important on the, I don't know, if you have an open field, then uh, you don't care about the values of the, of the frame field onto this uh, open field. Yeah. 
I don't know how to handle this uh, properly because it seems that in your loss, you are considering the, the full frame field of the whole image. And apart from the fact that, okay, you are maybe comparing the spatial gradients that you mentioned before uh, with the, the value of the frame field, you, are, you still have a loss on the full uh, frame field, I mean, the full dense frame field from all the, the pixels in the image. So, yeah, sorry, I have a, <laughs> a lot of <laughs> questions. In, in one, so yeah. So on this, so we always use this uh, smooth loss. Uh, so we haven't tried to turn it off. So that's an experiment that I will do for. Uh, we are preparing a, a publication on this. Um, so I think so. We observe that the. So just to be clear, the branch for the frame field that we add a line loss is only defined for pixels lying. Uh, around the the polyline of the branch group annotations. And so away from buildings or inside buildings, there's only this uh, smoothness loss that uh, is applied. <coughs> and uh, it's applied with a elevation <laughs> uh, kernel. Uh, so the network, I think at these points, um, if there's a strong texture, we'll discard the, the texture and we'll just align the frame field uh, smoothly. Uh, but we also observe that uh, even away from buildings, if there is a, a clear line to follow, for example, a road, or for example, we observe in, in the stadium, like the tracks to run around, the frame field still aligns to those obvious uh, lines in, in the image. Uh, so I believe it's the frame field is essentially looking at a low. Um, uh, Almost the local gradient in the image, but uh, removing the noise that uh, that it has. Um, yeah. So yeah, there was a lot of questions. Maybe there's one I didn't answer. And, uh, no. That's uh, no, no, that's okay. But uh, with respect to uh, what you said just before, so clearly, I think this frame field should it could be derived. Uh, from the, the basic uh, local info, uh, orientations that you uh, recover in the, in the image. So maybe you, we could expect that, uh, I mean, in, in the architecture that you consider, maybe we could expect that the frame field could be directly output from the first layers of uh, the network that you are, uh, that, that you are uh, defining. No? I mean, so if we don't care about the smoothness of the field, um, maybe, uh, maybe we could do that. Uh, but for the smoothness, we need to, the network needs to have a larger uh, field of view. Um, so, yeah, I haven't tried, like we could try the very simple network to output the frame field just to see uh, how, how that would work. So yeah, the, the, the question is actually uh, maybe more general, it means that is the, the frame field that is extracted is, is really uh, uh, related to the basic orientation that you can already uh, extract from the image? Or is it related with uh, the more complex structures that you have? And it's like in, in a learning setting where you, you, okay, you, you know that, okay, this is a building, so this should be the corresponding frame field uh, to, the, to, to the building. So, I mean, it's it's mixing both uh, low-level information from the gradients, and at the same time, maybe this high-level information that is okay. This is a building, and this is what the frame field should look like uh, for such uh, an object. So yeah. So if we want to be sure, of course, we will need to make experiments. But I believe uh, it, it looks first at local uh, gradients in the image, uh, but also. I mean, it cleans those gradients. So those gradients wouldn't be the right one for the corner of the building. Uh, but here, so it has uh, learned also somehow what corners look like in order to output the real uh, orientation at corners, which cannot be readily estimated just from, from the image. It needs to, be, to learn some semantics of corners. Uh, but because even if we, we observe that even if we learn it only on building, it still aligns outside of buildings. Uh, it leads me to believe that it, it doesn't really care if it's a building or not. So I don't 
I don't think it needs semantic information of the building in order to to do its job and, and allow. Okay, 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 okay. Thanks uh, for the uh, for the answer. Thanks so maybe I have. Um, Okay, I, I we maybe stop because I've taken a lot of time to uh, for those questions. But uh, I have a final question about the fact that you mentioned the spatial transformer in your in your uh, perspectives uh, for work. Mm. So um, that's I think uh, yeah uh, maybe a trendy topic and uh, also very uh, interesting way of seeing the the problems the, the spatial transformers, but. At the same time, there is this idea of uh, attention behind it, which is also uh, critical in some ways. And I think that maybe in, in your case, I mean, maybe uh, for detecting buildings, for instance, maybe the attention is a, a concept that would clearly help in, uh, in finding maybe a face, faces of the building that are parallel or uh, corners. I mean, if you have four corners, that means that you should look at the four position in the, in the image. So, uh, so uh, yeah, that was more of, a, of an open question. So, do you, do you have an idea of how to to, to really uh, exploit this idea of uh, attention, uh, maybe in, in future works? So, I think attention, yes, would be very useful for the alignment problem, especially because the alignment problem. Uh, looks at very, very far uh, relations between the input uh, displaced uh, polygons and the input image. So in our work, we it's, it has a maximum displacement of four pixels. So I think that's why it still works. But if we would we we could worry we were to use a single network for like the whole thirty-two pixels, potentially uh, the output of the displacement for one pixel has to look at uh, 32 pixels away from its location, which is very hard for a neural network to do, unless we add this uh, attention module. Um, so yes, I think it would be very beneficial to, to have this kind of uh, attention mechanism at the neural network for the displacement uh, task. Okay, thanks a lot for all your answers. And again, congratulations. Uh, I really think your work is, uh, is very good. And uh, thank you. Well. Thank you. So, thank you all for the question. So, now this is the turn of uh, Justin Solomon, professor at MIT, to ask some questions. Hi, uh, uh, Nicole. It's, 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 it's so much fun to uh, see your, your talk. I wish I could be, <laughs> I really wish I could be there in person. <laughs> it seems much more interesting than Boston. Um, and congratulations on some really fabulous work. You know, it's, uh, it was a pleasure to read your thesis. Of course, I was familiar with the second half already and, and uh, got to learn uh, a bit more about some of these applications in uh, remote sensing and GIS, all that good stuff. Um, and of course, uh, congratulations on a nice talk and, and frankly, uh, answering lots of good questions from my uh, colleagues on this uh, committee. Uh, right, so I guess I can ask, uh, I mean, I think uh, 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 Nicola and Lorenzo have done a, a nice job of <laughs> giving you a hard time here. Uh, but of course, I'm, I'm happy to uh, ask a few uh, more questions about your work. Um, so one of the ones, uh, so maybe I'll ask a few just high level things. Um, so of course the, the application that you focused on in your uh, defense here uh, was, was in remote sensing and, and uh, satellite data. But many of the techniques that you're using and the problems that you're, you're, you're solving are relevant to some of the challenges that we face in computer graphics and, and vectorization and those sorts of things. Um, what I'm wondering is, uh, can you tell us a bit about whether any of the insight from the research that you presented today could be useful in that community? Um, so maybe uh, vectorization of sketches uh, instead of looking at um, pure gradients from the image, we could use a, a small uh, neural network to estimate this uh, the, the frame field mm -hmm. and. Uh, that outputs maybe clean gradients. Uh, yeah. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, just a speculative, you know, that's uh as the uh, American on your committee, I have to ask lots of high level speculative stuff. It's hard to yeah, speculate about <laughs> other domains that I don't know much about. Yeah. <laughs> no, no problem. So in the uh, in the first page in the first part of your 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 defense, you you, you told us about this uh, alignment algorithm that has this interesting, I guess, destructive interference <laughs> uh, style uh, uh, training procedure, right? Where you you use it as a ground truth, and somehow the noise cancels out and, and it improves. What I'm wondering is whether there's any possibility of detecting in this sort of self supervision procedure what the useful examples are. Um, like currently you just use um, the output of your network just to, to train without trying to find good examples for training. Is there any hope of like using, you know, some measure of confidence or something to try and figure out which examples are gonna be the most useful for the next iteration of training? Um, so maybe some kind of uh, hard negative mining or to find the samples where the network makes the, the highest error. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it would be useful for uh, any kind of uh, machine learning algorithm. Um, in the case of denoising, if somehow the network knows if the ground truth annotation is less noisy than others, uh, of course it should uh, use it more. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how it can. Uh, I guess we can try to see if the confidence output. I mean, the the thing with the displacement probability, sorry, the displacement map is that we don't have the the same kind of uh, confidence output that we have for segmentation because it only outputs the 2D vector. It doesn't say how confident it is in that 2D uh, vector. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are, so there are methods that alongside this also output some confidence score, but then this confidence score has to be learned uh, also. Um, so maybe it's something, something to try. Got it, interesting. So, um... In your work on, on polyvectors, so you, you, you mentioned uh, regularizing uh, your, that like as a, a piece of future work, you could think about uh, trying to encourage your system to find parallel contours because, you know, buildings have parallel sides. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how you might go about implementing such a regularizer. It seems kind of interesting because it's non local. Yeah. So I actually already, began this work of uh, regularization. Uh, so in the polygonization pipeline, we have this uh, optimization uh, for the, each edge of the polyline to align to the frame field. Uh, but then we can, we can add more energies to this the, the same optimization uh, pipeline. And um, so for example, I tried to add uh, a term to ensure a straight walls or actually a uh, regular angle so that even if the polyline follows a, a circle, it ensures that each vertex has the same angle so that it follows the perfect uh, circle. Uh, I didn't tackle the problem of uh, parallel walls, but we can imagine once we have the, the geometry of those polylines to detect polylines which are close together, maybe uh, belong to the same cycle or the, the same polygon and objects. Mm -hmm. If they are already almost parallel, to force them to be parallel, again with a, an additional energy term. But then the, the problem of using additional energy terms for regularization is, well, I mean, first it's very, it's really easy to do, so it's nice. But, but the problem is it's still inside a, it's, it's still added to a final energy. Um, so some energies have to fight with each other such that we can maybe make the walls a bit more parallel together, but we will not ensure like full parallelity or full uh, circleness, for example, or full um, uh, straight angles at corners. Uh, 
so at some point, I think some uh, some solving global solving on the uh, the geometry is needed, and uh, I haven't uh, pursued the, this uh, direction. Cool. So, uh, and, and also in your, your future work, you mentioned uh, experimenting with different numbers of, of poly vectors. Um, and so I, what I'm kind of curious about, um, the, the poly vector representation is a little bit tricky because ahead of time you have to decide how many uh, vectors you're gonna work with, right? So like in your future work, you mentioned six in your current paper, you use four. Uh, and in fact, you made a decision, I think that they have to be opposite each other. Um, is there any way to introduce a representation that is agnostic to the number of vectors or, or kind of chooses the number on the fly rather than having to, you know, decide on some constant ahead of time? Uh, I think it would be quite challenging for the, the representation. So in terms of implementing it, uh, we need some kind of fixed number of outputs, ideally, uh, for, for the, the graphics card, for example. So the first idea that comes to mind is to output the, the maximum um, number of uh, oriented or vectors that we might need. And then uh, to let the neural network maybe decide how many to use uh, by, for example, collapsing two of the, of the orientations. Uh, maybe we can have a kind of loss that enforces uh, sparseness in, in the output. Uh, but then it, it will it will not guarantee that two output um, vectors are exactly the same. Maybe they they will be very close because of this sparseness loss that wants to to put um, output vectors as close together. Uh, so maybe some selecting process afterwards would be needed to remove two vectors that are really close uh, in, in the output. Got it. All right, so maybe I'll just ask one or two more kind of high level questions and then, and then we'll call it for today. Uh, so one, one high level thing. So, so your work is extremely impressive in part, like just because of all of the engineering that goes into making these neural networks work with many different moving parts, like these multi-resolution things, as well as many different loss terms. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about the lessons you've learned in terms of how to choose, uh, like sort of echoing some of the, the questions from, from the other folks who, who've uh, spoken today. How do you go about choosing all of these different parameters and architectures and so on in a, in a scientific way? Like what's, uh, you know, is there some systematic procedure that you would recommend for us to, to use as we try and engineer our own complicated uh, machine learning procedures? Uh, yeah, that's something I had to learn along the way, I guess. Uh, I think the, and also looking at the example of other researchers, I think like all machine learning practitioners agree that we should first use architectures that already exist that other people prove uh, work and try to adapt them. So that's why we mainly use this uh, UNET uh, architecture. And then on this UNET, we might try different uh, encoders. Uh, same for, for the loss function. We use the cross entropy loss or the, the dice loss. And then, and then at some point, if we want to change something, uh, we need to, to test it, of course, to see if it's actually better. And here, because we do machine learning, we can only, only test this by using uh, data and specifically using a, a test uh, or validation, validation uh, split of the data sets. Uh, so it's very experimental and, and very, how do I say, empirical uh, way to, to choose all kinds of uh, hyperparameters. And because there are so many hyperparameters, sometimes I, there's just no time or enough uh, computational uh, capability, capacity to actually test every single combination of uh, hyperparameters. And so some are 
chosen or, or tricked until it works, but maybe if we tweak them further, it will work even better. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's like somehow we were uh, getting closer to biologists than mathematicians, you know, trying to study. <laughs> um, Got it. All right. So, so Nicola, I have one last question for you, just just for fun. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask this kind of thing or not. So your your, your committee members can tell me if I, I've stepped out of bounds. Uh, so, one detail in your thesis that I thought was kind of interesting uh, is that you tested some of your procedures on a data set that was marked as private uh, because it was, uh, I guess, property of a, a company you were collaborating with. Yes. Here's my high level question as, as, a, as a PhD graduate, hopefully, who's uh, about to enter the scientific community. How do you view the balance between the advantages of partnering academia and industry with reproducibility? Like, how, how does that, how do you balance those two things? Uh, it's a very good question because, so as uh, for me in this case, I received data from a uh, from a private company, Luxcarta. So it's very rewarding to have this kind of um, capacity to provide very nice annotations on uh, a large array of different images and also provide real case um, examples so that we can test our algorithm on data that current companies are interested in. However, when I read a paper and it says it's a private data set, I cannot use it. I'm also very disappointed. Um, I think the right balance would be a companies that provide this, this data, but then make them open for everyone to use. Um, that would be, of course, the, the, the best world for, for the private sector and the academic sector to, to work together. Cool, okay. Anyway, it's just a, a kind of fun thing to think about. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, in that case, I think we've probably asked, I've, uh, I've heard a lot of questions from, from our colleagues too, so maybe I'll uh, uh, defer, but, but many congratulations on some really nice work. And uh, yeah, it's such a pleasure to hear the summary of your whole thesis here. Thank you. Hey, thanks for all these nice questions. We have a last uh, remote uh, examinator, so Guillaume Charca. So Guillaume, you are there. Turn to ask questions. Uh, hello, do you hear me and do you see me? We hear you, but we don't see you. Ah. Well, it was working before. Well, uh, without the image then. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I don't have a lot of uh, questions, of course. Uh, so, uh, so Nicolas, I would like to, to thank you. Uh, it was really a pleasure to, to, to work with you. And uh, I would like to, uh, oh, I can see the video now. So do you, I guess you can see it also. So um, uh, I would like to, to highlight a few points that I particularly uh, appreciated uh, with you. So the fact that like, like discussing was uh, really nice and that uh, you are very like dynamic. Uh, uh, like we, when we have uh, ideas and you, you go implementing them and like, uh, we, you know how to, to manage a whole pipeline of research, like uh, like uh, figure out how all the little issues that can happen like between the idea and the actual implementation. And in particular, like something that is not often uh, stressed uh, about neural networks is that uh, on papers it looks cool that there's a neural network that works, but actually there's a lot of engineering work before to, to make it work. So, for example, when you had the idea of uh, using uh, UNET, uh, so just UNET that actually normally meant for this kind of task, it was not working at the beginning, and you had the idea of adding this uh, additive auxiliary losses at uh, each level of the of the network to uh, to manage to to train it, and that I remember that was uh, not obvious to, to do. Uh, so I liked a lot that the these ideas that you you had to to just try to to you know this a uh, successive this iterative, iterative scheme that you have where you you learn on the output of the network in a cycle like this uh, that 
uh, actually led to uh, to impressive denosing results that uh, I really did not expect at the beginning. I thought it was uh, it would just not work, but actually, uh, well, that was a uh, quite impressive result in the end. So, so that's it. Thanks again, and it was a pleasure to uh, to work with you. Thank you. Okay, so thanks, uh, Guillaume. So now uh, we, we have um, also um, Adrien Pousseau who uh, come to ask some questions. Uh, you, you can talk from where you are loud, or you can come near, near here if you like. Thanks, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be this guest yeah. member of the committee. Uh, remote sensing is not my field, but yet I understood a lot from your manuscript, uh, I guess because it's well written, but also because you leverage tools that are also used in graphics, so I could recognize um, some of uh, these toolbox. So I just have one question, which is quite open actually. So in your thesis, it, chapter two and, and three, uh, or oh, and four actually, you use deep learning and end-to-end -end learning to solve what I would consider geometric tasks, like polygon alignments, polygon vectorization. And then in chapter five and six, somehow you fall back to a two-step process where you use deep learning for segmentation, but then rather traditional optimization for the geometric task of polygon alignment, polygon vectorization. So what's your opinion? Does that mean that deep learning is actually not the proper tool for those geometric tasks? And if so, how would you choose when to use learning and when to use optimization? Uh, so yes, in, at the beginning, we wanted to, to build a fully end-to-end -end model for polygonization. Because in some way in the deep learning community, that's the the ultimate goal to to have is to to use only deep learning for one task. Uh, so, but when we tried, um, it was very difficult to do because of this very the variability in the output, the variable number of vertices, the variable types of topologies with uh, holes in, in buildings, for example. Um, which in the end make it, makes it very hard for a neural network to, to, to handle this kind of, of, uh, of topology in the end in the data, in the structure of the data. And so that's why we, we fell back to the maybe more traditional approach of segmentation plus vectorization, uh, while still adding some geometry uh, some, how do I say, some sense of geometry to the output of the neural network, this additional quantum. So the segmentation is still has some geometric uh, interpretability, but as we saw, it's, it's really not enough. And yes, uh, this ranking idea was, was very nice. So I, you also asked when to choose between deep learning and traditional. Uh, I think deep learning is very is very efficient at um, general pattern recognition, so to transform uh, inputs into outputs, and especially if it's in a, a grid-like structure for so image into image or image into classification vector. And so, if we keep this structure, uh, it's very efficient, and also it's very efficient when the output of a certain pixel depends only about the, the local uh, context of that pixel. If there's very large uh, dependencies, it begins to, to fail more. Um, so I think, yeah, we have to, to, to use the um, deep learning where it's good at and, uh, and use the rest for, for where it's, it's less, uh, less uh, adapted to. Thank you for the question and the answer. So now it's the turn of your supervisor, Julia Sabatla. Thank you. Hi. Um, 
Hello, the question you just have Well, so congratulations, Nicola. You've done it. Uh, I joined the comments of Guillaume, so it was really fun working with you. So you have, uh, during three years, you had the very nice balance between understanding real world problems, brainstorming and uh, proposing ideas, and uh, indeed, uh, like this very big last chunk of uh, implementation and engineering to improve the course, and like very last experimentation part to prove others that what we did. Uh, they work. Um, well, still, so I'll ask one question. Uh, I mean, it's philosophical, but also very concrete. So, uh, I mean, indeed, your results look very nice. Then you showed some accuracies where you showed that it's kind of some accuracy measure is 80 percent, and angle error is 31 percent or 30 percent. Mm -hmm. So, I want zero <laughs> angle error. And I want hundred percent accuracy. Mm -hmm. So, what do you suggest me to do? Ah, uh, you mean what to improve on the current? I mean, thirty angle? percent, thirty, 30 degree yes, angle, is angle. Both, right? So that's the. So what should I do next? Yeah, so that's the average uh, maximum angle error. Yeah. Um, so that's why it's really, really high. If I look at the worst case scenario. Uh, I, I do this because if I only use the average angle. We don't see any difference between the, the methods or so, uh, because generally, for easy cases, uh, all methods, of course, solve them very similarly. Uh, so we only uh, look at the hardest uh, cases. So that's why it has. It may appear that it has a high error. Uh, also, I think physically, machine learning cannot have a perfect. Uh, Output or perfect uh, accuracy. Uh, it needs to to somehow um, how do I say? It, it optimizes a certain law function on on in the end very limited data data compared to all the possible images that it may encounter. So we cannot expect it to. To have zero error on the test data set. Um, also, another problem is that these test data sets, in order to measure the error, we have a certain ground truth, which also in the end also has some error. No ground truth is perfect. So even if we had a method to, to add the perfect predictions, we would still measure some kind of error. So to complete my question, so, I mean, I agree with you that we did. So we have some errors in the ground truth, which influence uh, like the numbers. But I mean, I think you agree that you have some real errors, right? Some misbehaving, yes. some over predictions, some wrong mm -hmm. directions, and some lack of regularization. Mm -hmm. So, if you don't give your PhD today and if you delay it for three more years, <laughs> so what do you do? Because I want 100%. <laughs> Uh, you mean to increase performance for segmentation? Exactly. I'm a map producer. I want uh, mm. something really working. What do you propose? So you, I guess you talk more about um, like additional methods to, to increase instead of just adding more data because that's the machine learning. That's the obvious answer to add more data. That's Closer to the test data to work on uh, generalization or, in the end, the domain adaptation. So, I think, in terms of methodology, I would work more on adding the ability to reason to, to neural networks so that it can generalize better and, especially, so that it can uh, learn about uh, compositionality. Uh, for example, if we have a scene. Like an endorsing with some objects, there's an exponential number of ways to arrange those objects in the scene. In the neural network, in order to understand all these kinds of scenes, it will have to to sample the whole space, which has an exponential size. Uh, instead of learning individual, uh, like learning maybe the uh, what a chair is individually from its rotation and translation. Uh, so yeah, I, I would work more on 
adding visibility of neural networks maybe to help understand the structure of the world uh, instead of just doing pattern matching or pattern recognition. Thank you. Thank you. So on the last one. <laughs> I hope you. Thanks uh, for answering all these questions and I would like also to thank your advisor for inviting me and uh, to us at the it's not my specialty, but I really enjoy it and I learned a lot. So uh, thanks so. because uh, as I said, it's quite clear and uh, it's quite uh, easy to flow. You put the effort to, to explain the, the different parts. That's very thank nice. You. I really appreciate that. So th th there was uh, something I I was not sure. Mm -hmm. So for the, the first part, so it was nice. So you had the two parts. So the first part for the misalignment. So you provide as a input uh, some misalignment, uh, let's say. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what you you say is that when you have a missing building, you can uh, still guess uh, the the building even mm -hmm. if it was not there. But when you have uh, one building with the wrong shape, uh, it's hard to get to the um, mm -hmm. uh, to correct the shape. Is it? Uh, so if there's a building, for example, missing uh, some parts, there will still be this segmentation output. But then somehow we would have to merge the the aligned annotation with the segmentation. So we haven't worked on that part, uh, but it's something that I think will be a bit more challenging than just detecting the completely new building. And so why not uh, removing each building uh, at a time to, uh, to to try to see if the, the guess one corresponds to the, the original? Uh... I think, yeah, maybe it's possible if we detect a building, Check if it fits the aligned one. If it doesn't, we just remove the aligned one, and then and then we extract the building from this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so you should be able to correct even a wrong uh, wrong building. Mm -hmm. As I believe so. Yeah. And, and, and so you so if I understood also correctly, if, even if you put uh, uh, no uh, branch roof, you can still regenerate uh, most of the the buildings. Um, how do you mean if so if, if we, you provide as input uh, no building no building uh, yes so if we don't add input any uh, building in the misaligned uh, polygon input we have the full segmentation map as well and actually for training we remove buildings in the input for the neural network to find new buildings because that didn't say during the presentation but if we don't do that it, it doesn't learn New buildings because they are already in the input. It's just very easy to copy the inputs. And and so the the, the question is uh, how um, how much front uh, roof do you need, even misaligned, uh, to get to some res because I guess that the the, the result that you get uh, the quality uh, uh, degrade uh, if you have less uh, branch roof. So did, did you try to measure how much? Uh, 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 one two buildings, even misaligned, do you need to, to get uh, something uh, usable? Uh, so, by maybe reducing the size of the trained data set and see if it works, or? Well, let's, once you have trained your, uh, your network, mm -hmm. so when you test it, so how much, uh, uh, how much uh, first uh, annotation do you need to, to get some uh, reasonable uh, results? Uh, so once the network is trained, do you mean to have to, to have enough annotations in order to compute the element error and yes, just yes. validate the the network? Or, yes, yes. Uh, so I don't know, but so I haven't tried uh, different test that uh, sizes. I think it's a good question, especially to choose. How much validation data to to select? Because usually in machine learning we have a, a whole train data set. We have to to extract from this training data set a validation data set we don't train on in order to validate our method. Uh, but there's there's still there's a struggle going in our minds because we want the most trained samples so that our final model is better. But then we don't have enough samples to validate our data on. Uh, 
So uh, we have to find like a middle ground between the two. And uh, usually I just take maybe like 75% of train and the rest for validation, but it's completely arbitrary. I think it's very, would be very nice to know or to have a method to find out uh, how much validation data we need, but also more importantly, how the quality of this or the variability of the validation data. Because I think if we have 10 images which are very similar, it's not much, much different than one image of those same 10 types of images. Okay. Uh, another question is uh, um, why do we just shoot the segmentation of buildings and not of the wall uh, image? Because the, the fact of knowing there is a road, there is other structure, it helps a lot, no? So, uh, many for me, I just uh, I focus on buildings because. Uh, there are small data sets for buildings. And also sometimes there's a data set for buildings and one for roads, not for both of them. Uh, so to, because I wanted to focus on task of vectorization, I didn't focus on uh, vectorization, vectorizing uh, multiple <coughs> classes. But I think for training, it helps to a certain degree to have more classes. But at some point it does, too many classes, the network has to have, has more work to do, and maybe it becomes more uh, complicated. Well, you know, self-driving car, uh, <laughs> they are doing in real time and that, and simulation of the whole scene, the yes. sidewalk, road, and trees, and people, and uh, it's no problem. Huh? And that's the opposite, and it helps the, the, the it constraints the representation, so it makes something more, uh, more stable. Okay. Uh, uh, that's true that if you don't have a train uh, system and so if you don't, maybe you miss some annotations or to train uh, your, your network, but that's yeah. good, a way to improve <laughs> yes. more from the better quality. Uh, uh, adding more classes. Uh, yeah. that's, uh, and I really like so the, the, the system of uh, self-learning. Uh, so the, we call it a pseudo annotation, what uh, you, uh, you obtain. In my field, also we are using it a lot, and that's true. As uh, the, the the question before, they said that uh, being able to assess the quality of the pseudo annotation helps a lot to know how much you can uh, incorporate back to the to your system. Mm -hmm. And so, usually, when it's uh, not uh, is, if it's, uh, the quality is too bad, you just uh, remove it. Remove it from the yeah. yeah. And the typical manner to do it is. Uh, to one way, there's several ways on to compute the, the, the likelihood of your pseudo annotation. But if you move a little bit your uh, your uh, pseudo -annot annotation, mm -hmm. uh, you see how much uh, it, uh, it changed in the in the output. Okay. So some people measure this way the the likelihood. Mm -hmm. So do you think you could apply it in your in your case? Mm -hmm. I think. Because it reminds me of a paper I read after I was finishing that project, uh, which would learn alignments using two different uh, misaligned annotations and see if they end up in the same yeah. spot. So I think it's yeah, yeah, that's it's very same. similar. And um, yeah, I think I mean it would should benefit the, the multiple ones training scheme. Um, I believe so. In my case, we use it for a human skeleton. And so we have the same thing. We have, you know, uh, joints and bones. Yes. And we try to align the, the annotation with the RGB image. And so similar techniques is used. So in self-learning. And usually most of people are using also the notion of uh, student and teacher. Yes. So did you try to, uh, to look at that? Uh, no, I didn't try about this. Uh, so it's usually done to distill the knowledge of the neural network or to have smaller students. Yeah, that's one way. One so way. that's uh, that's true. You could use it at the end to reduce your uh, the, the number of parameters of your system to make mm -hmm. it more compact, as you say. But here it's mostly because uh, the knowledge you you get it by the this uh, pseudo annotation. So you improve it uh, step after step. Yes. And so the knowledge is come from the the, the pseudo annotation, mm. but it can come also from the the the, the weights in your neurons. Mm. So usually you have uh, one uh, the teacher uh, one that uh, 
uh, keep, but you um, update little by little and the, the student that you use with all your pseudo annotation. So one is more stable and you just uh, incorporate a little part of the, 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 the change of the, the weights of your, uh, of your network. Okay, so so thanks to more slowly. Yes, but, yes, but so there's one that learns more like faster and yes, yes, exactly. One, one learns faster, so for specific maybe buildings, it will uh, try to find a good way, but maybe it will make some uh, mistakes from uh, others, and so that's why you have one that uh, uh, learn uh, slowly but more, uh, more, stable. more stable way. And that usually you can get a much better performance. So that's a good, uh, good way. Uh, yeah, so, oh, yeah, and uh, uh, so this is supervised. Mm -hmm. Did you think about unsupervised manner to do it? Uh, so I thought about, uh, I mean, yeah, I thought about maybe more weekly supervision because we still have annotations. Um, because when, when I started this, this uh, alignment method, of course, I had a lot of misland ground truth. So I asked myself if it, it was possible for the network to somehow learn an, like alignments even with these uh, annotations. Because as a human, if we see even a misaligned annotation uh, above a building, we, we understand that it's meant to, to represent that building. Um, and I think maybe if, if we were to train a segmentation model with these misaligned annotations, in general, it will still detect buildings, but not very precisely. Um, so maybe after once this model is trained, uh, yeah, maybe it's possible to to use this knowledge of the, the global position of the building. Uh, for alignment, um, but completely unsupervised. Completely unsupervised. Yeah. Mm, I think completely unsupervised. We need to somehow look at the texture underneath the misaligned annotation and try to. To without harmonize. Annotation. Sorry? Without annotation. Uh, I mean, even not misaligned annotation, zero annotation. Uh, so to learn alignment or to, yeah, learn, to learn just the polygons from a uh, so for the second project or to learn from scratch to extract the buildings or. Uh, so, I mean, if there have been some work for segmentation where the, the whole pipeline chooses to, to, to segment a certain object and to move it uh, on the image and checks if the image still makes sense. And so if the segmented part of the image is still an object, then even if you move it in the image, it still looks like an image. So that means you, you segmented an object. You don't know if it's a, a building or a, a car, etc. cetera. Uh, so I think those, approaches are, are really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so you still need, in, in this scenario, the ground truth is the, the natural images, but you know they, are, they were captured by a real a camera in the real world, so you know that there are real images. Um, so something like that I think may work for building a segmentation. Yeah, so in, in, in CVPR 2020, there's a paper for unsupervised uh, generation of skelet. Okay. And so the, the, the way they do, they generate in the same time the segment. So, so for you, it would be segmentation and uh, the polygons mm -hmm. in, in an image. And uh, what they do is they use like adversarial to, uh, to learn what should be uh, the, 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 the style of uh, buildings and, uh, and so on. And after they reconstruct, they have a loss to reconstruct the initial uh, image. Oh, okay. So they, they separate, separate the, of images yeah. and then build back an image which look like an image. Or yeah, they separate the, they say the, the appearance from the, 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 the shape 
And ah, after okay. that, try to wash away. Ah, okay, I see. Okay, so, um, yeah, so, so far, the, the, the second part also, I really like it. And as uh, everybody uh, mentioned, this, uh, uh, this frame field is very uh, new, innovative. I think that was uh, quite yeah. pleasant to, uh, to see. Uh, just a small question. So the, the, the two direction U and D, they, they are not always orthogonal. Yes, but it's most like in your illustration that we see that they are most of the time they are orthogonal, but not uh, in general, let's say. Yes. So in general, we don't constrain them to be orthogonal, uh, but we also have this L align 90 loss, which enforces them to be orthogonal, but not in a, it's not a hard constraint. So if, um, so in corners, you can align to, for example, 45 degree, Angled corner, so you have you here and, and you there, but everywhere else it, it will just align at uh, 90 degrees. But did you notice in your uh, samples that sometimes you have uh, angles uh, different than 90 degrees? Uh, I think because I mean, in most of uh, I didn't see in yeah. this always. <laughs> I think usually it's close to it's never exactly 90 degrees. Uh, but uh, in general, it's close to 90 degrees. And, uh, and do you think it would change a lot if you just use one direction? Ah, so that's uh, something. Um, so with one direction, it would work on the like walls of buildings or away from these singularities, which are building corners. But then at the building corner, the network will not know which one. Which one to yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so that's uh, that's. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, so for the segmentation, you use uh, two uh, loss and uh, the dice and the cross entropy. Uh, yes. So, so the dice is quite uh, often used because in our case we use uh, usually cross entropy for segmentation. Okay. So, do you think that the the, the dice uh, help a lot? Did you? Uh, I think it helps to. Did you try without or to have both? Ah, uh, so it's very common, at least maybe. In in remote sensing uh, yes yes it's common depending of field for example yeah. for medical images and the uh, mm -hmm. remote sensing they use it but not in the in our domain uh, i think it's because the final metric we use is uh, attention attestation volume and so the dice loss is the soft estimation of this or a differentiable um, version of intersection of volume so that's why people want to use this because it should be closer but yeah. then we add cross entropy because it helps. Uh, it helps train and uh, better optimization. So, but did you, you haven't checked uh, removing some loss and to see how much uh, impact uh, how much it brings. Uh... Mm, so no, I haven't checked how to because both of them are added together. So you also have a coefficient between the two, and so I haven't tried like. Uh, and it's good for your ablation studies to, mm. to from time to remove the different flows to see how much they, they contribute and how much is uh, useful. Yes. That's that's always uh, interesting. Mm. But uh, after that's true, what you say, it really depends how you evaluate your uh, final results because you, you optimize uh, your network according to the end pass. That's a metric, yeah. And uh, so I think uh, more because of the F score that you use at the end or it's also exactly yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, so there's one other I was uh, uh, not sure. Uh, it's bit you say that one of the main uh, uh, improvements on your on your technique so it's this uh, common wall mm. between uh, adjoining buildings. Uh, yes. But for me it's very simple because when I see your image, sometimes uh, it looks like it's different buildings, sometimes it looks... <laughs> so how do you know? How, how can uh, you know it's... Uh... So I think in general, we... Like if it detects a common wall, it, it is a common wall, but uh, we, we miss also the uh, common wall because it's, it's harder to, to detect than uh, the transition between building and just the outside. Uh, so we haven't... I yeah, haven't found a way to measure like if we have false qualities in, in terms of uh, in our walls. Because so in the training data set, we have 
this uh, this uh, inner walls in, in the annotations. In, so in the ground truth, in shell ground in truth. The ground truth. So some experts decided or saw that it's uh, it's a different building. So usually it's because it's a different roof, and and you see maybe a line with with the, the wall there. Um, sometimes it's difficult to say. Yeah, because sometimes you have big buildings with a on path. So actually, uh, so if we have one building with different parts, it's still interesting to have to segment those parts separately. But they, as, as you say, sometimes we, we don't know if it's part of the same building or not. Maybe there's some passageway between the two buildings uh, we cannot tell. And so for that, you don't have a, you, you haven't tried to quantify uh, the improvement in terms of uh, common wall. So in our case, it's like a extra contribution. So previous method don't care about it at all. Uh, uh, so like we couldn't even compare to, to someone else. But yes, we, we haven't uh, uh, like quantified how many compared to the ground truth uh, how many was we missed for other segments. Yeah. I think we missed more, a lot more than we, uh, we detect uh, false uh, positives. Yeah, because if it's one of the nice property of your, your network, uh, it's good if you can quantify, so it's uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so I think it's a bit tired. I'm going to stop. <laughs> so, so do anyone who has a you want to ask a question? Uh, oh, no. So uh, thanks to, to everybody. So I think we are going to deliberate in this uh, room. Is it in this room or did you book a special room for it? No? Okay, then stay here. I will just kick out Mulin.